Okay. All right. Good morning again. Um, so um, I'm addressing the topic of fertigation. So uh, for citrus specifically, let's go ahead and get started. By way of introduction, fertigation is really simply defined as the ability to apply soluble fertilizer and irrigation simultaneously to the growth through the existing irrigation equipment. Scheduling with fertigation is therefore somewhat complicated by the need to supply both water and nutrient requirements of the trees in correct amounts during the entire growing season. Being that it's a perennial crop, so it's the entire growing season is, is an important thing. Um, so optimally implemented fertigation has been shown numerous times to reduce water and nutrient requirements and also increases growth rates of the citrus and ultimately therefore the yields. All are therefore desirable attributes in an HLB affected growth. And uh, the main topic of my talk today is to introduce to you a decision support program, or DSP, which I developed to help growers optimize their fertigation systems to get the most out of them uh, with citrus growth and yield production. And it's following along the theme of the ACPS that most of you are familiar with, and open hydroponics. Um, so just as a form of background, uh, I want to show you this slide, which uh, shows the origin of soil fertility and the functions of soil fertility and water holding capacity in Florida soils. But starting off first, um, the, 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 the first part of it is to show you the um, typical, I would say, world soil, which is not a Florida soil. So Florida soils are very unusual. So. If I had to take an average agricultural soil in the world, you'll see that there's, a, there's different pools of nutrients, and that's really what I want to show you here. And also different pools of water holding capacity, strictly speaking, which is that first one. Um, but uh, the main thing is to keep in mind, a nutrient will only be taken up by a root system if it is in solution. It has to be dissolved. So that's the first thing there. The key words there are soil solution. And you can circumvent that by applying liquid fertilizer. So keep that in mind too. The first pool available, and it's readily, uh, fast, uh, or rapidly available, so I put the word fast there, is the uh, dissolved uh, nutrients and also those that are, that are adsorbed to readily desorbable or readily available sources of exchange sites on the, on the soil, such as cation exchange capacity. There it is, CEC. And also fertilizer. Of course, it's readily available. That's a man-made attribute. So I've just listed the nutrients there. That we don't need to go into that. Let's look at the pools, rather. So as you notice from left to right, things slow down. The next one, which is more slowly available, is the organic matter, which can mineralize. You can add it as compost. It could be available as soil organic matter, and so on, uh, manures. And also, there's a lot of phosphorus that can be fixed in typical agricultural soils, which is slowly available and released over time. Then the very long-term pool is, the, of course, the minerals, and which are often soil-forming parent materials and some examples of mica and feldspars. So that's, that's a typical situation. But Florida is not typical, as I said, it's a bit of an outlier in terms of agricultural soils globally. So what I've just shown you here is by differences, low water, water and nutrient holding capacity, low CEC, low organic matter reserves, and predominantly quartz. So there's very few mineralizable nutrient holding minerals. And so the, by proportion, those um, oval shapes there represent the reduced pool of all of those attributes in Florida soils. So therefore they benefit very greatly from frequent additions of irrigation water together with nutrients in the form of fertigation. They prime candidates for fertigation, no matter what you grow in them. Okay, so um, that brings me to the next comment here, which is that open hydroponics or optimal fertigation diminishes the role of the soil and increases these efficiencies of uptake of nutrients and water. And so uh, those are, again, it's a copy of the previous slide and again a copy of the previous slide. So what I want to show here is that open hydroponics and optimal fertigation greatly increases this first portion of the graphic, which is the daily drip fertigation. You're bypassing a lot of the functions of the soil, so they become negligible, as I've shown here. It's the most efficient way to do it, but it has to be spoon-fed. So why I'm excited about it? Well, we've been developing, uh, or at least we've been proving and um, verifying the open hydroponic system in Florida for the last five years. Uh, time has flown. And uh, we're very excited with the results. And I'll show you some examples there. So I think it's really something that, that can be um, implemented successfully. 
Uh, here's a, the most recent one Lake, at Lake Alfred. This is Valencia on Swingle at one and a half years, grown with drip fertigation, two drippers per tree. It was taken just last week or the week before, these photos. Uh, so there we see a nice, well-grown tree at uh, one and a half years old. And actually, it, uh, if you look close up, you'll notice it had a tremendous flowering and fruit set. Um, of course, we have to wait to see what stays on the tree because it's, it's very young, one and a half years old. So a lot of that set fruit may drop. But nevertheless, it's off to a flying start. Here's a different grove. This is a commercial grower um, in the Dundee area. Vernia, this was taken last year. It's now a year older. So this is just an old archive photo I had at two years grown with drip fertigation at one and a half foot to 18 inch spaced drip line. So again, it was drip fertigated. And the spacing for, your, for those of you that are interested was eight by 18 feet, which is 303 trees per acre. So fairly high density. And uh, another slide, another diff completely different grove here showing you again the, the, the benefits of the optimal fertigation is at Lake Placid in our research grove. This is Vernia at uh, three years, uh, with, grown with drip fertigation at 18 inches apart, uh, similar to the other system. And it's also comparing, this experiment is also comparing it with microsprinkler at 7.7 .7 gallons per hour for each, uh, drip, for each uh, sprinkler emitter. And it's doing just as well. So my point here is it's not the drip that's, that's making, it, uh, making all the difference, it's the fertigation. And interestingly enough, we did a, a, a survey, just the, the latest survey for HLB in this grove, uh, in this block, and we found that in March 2014 it was 47% HLB positive already, and despite that, it looks very good. And this is a, one that many of you will have seen in our field, in our, uh, field days, the Ormondale um, ACPS experiment. This was a, a healthy tree. Uh, granted, there's a lot of HLB in that grove, but this is what a healthy tree looked like, what they should look like without disease, and uh, at year five. And this was grown with two drippers per tree. In that same trial, we, we also grew trees with microsprinkler fertigation at 10 and a half gallons per hour. So that's the orange jet, I believe. No, the, the, uh, the blue jet, maxi jet blue, and got the same results. Um, so again, drip or microsprinkler, if properly implemented, does a great job. So the common threads I'm trying to illustrate with those slides is uh, the following. Increased growth and early high yields are possible. The Lake Placid Grove that I showed you is slightly different. It's slightly behind on certain rootstocks. Of course, there's rough lemon, which we all know is a slow, uh, it's not as precocious as other rootstocks. So, so you had great vegetative growth, but not much yield yet. But the C35 and um, X639 we have down there, those rootstocks are doing much better. But in general, we've had very early high yields. Increased water and nutrient use efficiency has been proven over and over again. It's, it's nothing new. So it's a great advantage, you save yourself some money. Um, and the bottom line there is the minimal reliance on soil for water and nutrient storage. We don't, typically a, a, a traditional irrigation and fertigation method would involve storing a substantial amount of that water and nutrients for at least a few days, because you would have a maybe twice a week or once a week cycle, depending on the time of year and the, and the needs. With daily fertigation, you're not relying on storage. You're feeding almost directly to the root system. Okay, I'm not sure why that one's overprinted there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it took a while. Because it's, it's actually a short video. It should be looping, and you'll see, you'll see water bubbling out there. It's no big deal. Uh, so my point here is just that drip is, is an ideal system uh, for targeting that water and nutrients directly to the roots, as I've just st stated before, um, creating the highest efficiencies and, and followed by properly directed um, microsprinklers, as I'll uh, illustrate. If you properly in, uh, direct them to the root system, then they also do a great job. But anyway, this is the result you get with drip, uh, drip fertigation. You know, the root system really loves it, and it grows strongly and healthily around that dripper. And here's a microsprinkler, same type of system uh, can be implemented with microsprinklers if you don't want to use drip. Um, when properly designed and implemented, it can achieve, achieve the same high efficiencies. In other words, the port, important thing is to target that root system, the active root system, appropriate for the size of tree. So for example, what one shouldn't do is, is, is uh, install microsprinklers in the upright position 
on newly planted trees because about 80 to 90 percent of the water will never reach the root system and you're just going to be throwing it away, especially if there's nutrients in that stream. Uh, so one trick is to invert the emitter, as you can maybe see here, I've got a better close-up. Just invert it and it directs it into a much smaller circle of spray than if you had it um, in the upright position. So here's an illustration. Here's the typical uh, uh, standard, what it was designed for, the upright position of the microsprinkler. Um, but it's too large for small trees, so uh, while the trees are small, it's, it's permissible to invert it and thereby accurately uh, direct the water and nutrients to the root zone. Here it is, there's just the illustration. It's simple to do with the same stand, you just turn it upside down. Um, when, they, when the trees grow and become mature then and large enough, you can simply turn it up the upright position again. There's nothing much to it. Um, here's, a, here's those one and a half year old trees, the Valencias on Swingle. And this is a nice bright sunny day, you can see a nice shadow there. What I wanted to just point out is with an inverted microsprinkler under that tree, you can probably just see the outline of the wetted zone there quite clearly. And uh, it's achieving uh, the right thing which we want to do, which is to wet the area under the canopy. And this is almost noonday sun, so you can see it's, it's, it's directly in that root zone. Had I not inverted that microsprinkler, it would have wetted a huge area all the way to the adjacent trees and into the middles where it was, wouldn't have been usable. So ad adopting some of those principles and, and concepts we've learned, uh, this decision support program was built and uh, one of the assumptions was that with daily fertigation, only enough water and nutrients are needed each day to match the requirements of the trees. So no storage, as I said before. Uh, soil water content is maintained near field capacity, thus reducing stress and maximizing crop evapotranspiration and growth. High evapotranspiration or water movement through the tree typically translates into higher growth and yields. Irrigation requirements for trees of different sizes or ages are calculated in this DSP from average historical daily ET at uh, potential ET, which is the evapotranspiration, uh, ET0 there, and the proportional ground coverage by the canopy. So this is a new, fairly new thing I, I have not seen implemented before where, where, where I calculate the requirement of different ages or different sizes of trees um, based on the size of their canopies. So that was a, an addition I, I put in. And then the nutrient uptake patterns of citrus trees are also inextricably related to transpiration patterns which is the water uptake, but they are, the, two com the two components or the two mechanisms are not necessarily dependent all the time on each other, but they are related, so just bear that in mind. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but without a doubt, uh, water uptake is related to nutrient uptake and vice versa. Maybe in a diagram coming up, I can illustrate that a bit better. Here's just a, a quick graphic of the water movement through a tree that <clears throat> gets taken up by the roots, and this is the transpiration component which goes through the leaves via the roots and the xylem, and then there's the evaporation component on the bottom there you'll see from the soil, that's the evaporation. So the two together make evapotranspiration, which is what we can measure. Um, so the, uh, this diagram just shows that the growth, especially in the roots uh, part of the tree, is inextricably related to transpiration, of course, and vice versa, and also to nutrient uptake. It's in the form of a little tri triangle there. The three are related. And just a little bit of background now. Uh, transpiration is proportional, therefore, to crop ET, evapotranspiration of the crop, because ET is transpiration plus evaporation. So that's really what I wanted to put in there. ET crop for a grove acre is related to canopy size. I've already said that. And it's ground coverage. So that's how this model works. The, <clears throat> the driving data for the model was historic um, information obtained from the Fawn data uh, uh, website, um, and I used 14 years for three different stations, a, a potential evapotranspiration. These are the average data showing you a very good fit. Um, so on the vertical axis, the title says average daily potential evapotranspiration in inches per day. And uh, that bottom axis is simply the time of year, the day of year. And um, this is the, bear in mind, this is the average weekly, each point is the average weekly ET for um, 14 years. So that's why there's a nice smooth fit. Uh, the, the fit, I'll, I'll explain how that was done in a minute. But I, I modeled three different sizes. Size. The first one was Lake Alfred, the next one Fort Pierce. Notice they are a little higher each time. And there's a Mockerley. So there, there are subtle differences, but not major. 
The type of curve is a half sinusoidal curve, so it's, it's like a portion of a sine curve, which is the oscillating curve, typical of repetitive seasonal oscillation. And there's just the proof of it. If I, ta if I copy that curve and invert it like that, it makes a sine wave. And that's what I've just done to illustrate there with a, with a dashed line. If I superimpose the models fitted for each station, Lake Alfred, Fort Pierce, and Immokalee, I do indeed prove that it's, you could use the same line, which I did then. So I went ahead and fitted one curve for all three stations. For purposes of a prediction model like this, scheduling model, you don't need um, separate information. Now that may not be true if you want to use actual daily ET coming from a weather station. That is absolutely not true, so bear that in mind. I can only make this generalization for historical data. Interestingly enough, of course, if you uh, cal calculate the cumulative evapotranspiration with day of year, so adding each daily ET together, you notice that it makes a, a different curve. It actually makes a, 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 a double exponential type of curve, not the sinusoidal curve, right? As this is what they call also sometimes a sigmoidal curve. Uh, showing you the uh, low ET in the uh, winter, going into the spring, very high, into summer, and then into the fall, it diminishes. So that's the cumulative curve. So there it is. It's a sigmoidal curve, and it's a great model for seasonal nutrient demand. Okay? So like I said, water uptake and nutrient uptake are inextricably um, tied together. Sorry, I went one too fast, I think. No? So what I've done, here's the model now, here's the DSP, this is one of the pages in it, and I've adopted this then as a, as a nutrient demand curve um, and scaled it, so you can put in your nitrogen, uh, total nitrogen requirement that you can, I'll show you how you would estimate that, per year, 150, here's the example, pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, and that, as you can see from the axis there, is at the end of the year, it reaches 150. So at any time along this curve, any day of the year, I can calculate where, where I should be in my nitrogen feeding, and therefore all the other nutrients. It's, it's a continuous function which allows me to calculate at any day of the year where I, where, how much nitrogen I should be applying on a daily basis. These lines here are very important, and I'll show you why. This is the mid-season, and it's approximately June, 100, let's say 180 days. And then this is the 66% of annual nitrogen fertilizer. And where the two cross, that's where you want to be at mid midpoint, you want to be at about 66%. You, you should have already applied 66%. Now that can be changed. You notice there's some controls up there. You can actually change the shape of that curve, and I'll show you. Hopefully the video will play. Um, if not, that's too bad. I can show you later. But um, by changing these parameters here, the shape of that curve can be dynamically changed to where you want it to be. If you decide you want 75% uptake by that point in time, then you can do that. So those are the daily nitrogen requirements, as I pointed out. So this is way too small for you to see, but it's important to illustrate that that's a screenshot. <clears throat> that's the main screenshot of the model. And I'll just point to general areas because I'm, no doubt you can't read it from, from on the small screen. But um, it's database driven, so there's a, there's a database where you can add all the records. Each one is a different block or a different irrigation zone. So you only do that once. The nice thing about it is it's a database-driven thing. So you, you, once you put it in there, you store it in there, all you need to do is start the program up when you want to get an update. It will then automatically get today's date or the current date down there and apply the model to the data that you've already stored for each, each block. And you just page through those. <clears throat> it gives you all the outputs here. You can modify any of the inputs, which are the, the lighter colored boxes. The grayed out boxes and the green box, they are all the results. The bottom lines that you want to focus on are fertilizer amount, gallons per day, that one there, and also irrigation required. And it's either in gallons per tree per day there or it's in minutes per day that you need to run your irrigation system. How does it know that? How, how long to run a given system? All the inputs are up here. Acres, spacing, uh, between rows and along the row. Um, you can also just add the number of trees in the, row if you, in the zone if you want to. Um, so it gives you trees per acre, uh, numbers of, number of emitters per tree, um, gallons per hour for each emitter, uh, efficiency factor, and then it calculates the, the water in gallons per minute for the zone. Very critical is this number here, average tree height. And that's, in this case, I've given an example of seven. From that, it can calculate the actual ET required for, 
for that size of tree in the grove. On the left-hand side, there are all the pink numbers there are fertigation information, and it includes the, the source of your fertilizer, the, the grade of fertilizer, especially the nitrogen. It, also, it then calculates your total dissolved solids. Um, you give the injection rate of your pump, and you, you, can, you can also, there's an option to add the EC or conductivity of your water. It then calculates the conductivity of your final fertilizer solution, your parts per million of nitrogen, um, your fertilizer amount, as I pointed out, and your injection time, how long you need to run the system for. And finally, a very important number I added here is the target nitrogen to date. So if you picture yourself anywhere along that curve, at this point in time, whatever date you put in there, it'll give you that number there. It's 41 pounds there. So it says, as of yesterday, when I last ran this, I should have applied 41 pounds out of 150. So it's, it's a nice way of keeping track of it. Okay, I think that's enough of that. I pointed out some of the thin labels. Um, anyway, while it's, while it's doing it, I can just quickly point out some of the other pages. There's that fertilizer curve there. That's a tab up there. And then there's also a, a, a tab there called DRIS. That's a Diagnosis and Recommendation Integrated System. Now, that was by request. I had some phone calls over the years, and again, just recently, people really want to use that DRIS system for leaf diagnosis. So I'm going to add that to this. You know, there's an opportunity here. Just put it in one program. And that's about it. I, obviously, it's taking way too long. It should have already shown. OK, there it's finally moved. But I, I'm going to try and cancel it, or maybe with some help. But you can change your nitrogen quantity there. And you notice the whole curve automatically readjusts. That's what it's doing now. But if you're interested, just, just call me, and we can figure it out. So for the, for the um, sake of time, I will skip that. Um, now, that, that gives you then all the outputs you really need. But remember, it's just a model. So when it rains, you need to pause it. Or if it's an automated system, it would automatically pause, right? And then when it's needed again, you start it again and resume your, your daily fertigation. Another very powerful tool is to use these soil moisture sensors. And that's what I've really found is most valuable for use with a model like this uh, for optimal fertigation, is that you let the model decide what it, want, what it thinks is the correct amount to apply every day and let your soil moisture sensor correct you. And this is the best way I've found that works. You put one in the, in the top soil, typically zero to four inches, and the other one at about 18 inches deep. So that's uh, below the dripper, below the dripper, or if it's below the microsprinkler. And um, the top one tells you the stages of your, most of your feeding zone, uh, root feeding zone, uh, the, the moisture content. And you, don't, you want this one to be relatively non-responsive, that's like the bottom of your pot, if that was like a pot in, the, in, a, in a, a tree growing in a pot. If it responds, then it's either from rain or over irrigation, over fertigation. Then you can trim back your amounts. So it gives you an opportunity to do course correction. Okay? And there's many, many versions of those. Here's one that shows you the moisture and the entire soil profile. I would recommend something like a TDR or a TDT. I've found over the years that they are better than the capacitance type probes. This is a TDT type sensor. This is actually happens to be a capacitance type probe. Typically, those with two rings like that are the capacitance types. These work for years buried in the soil. Uh, I found them to be really reliable and accurate. And of course, there's a computer controller. For daily fertigation, you really will need a, some kind of computer controller to do the work. Uh, you can't be out there every day running the system. So in summary, and uh, to show you a little bit of what future work may hold, um, the DSP we, we've developed, I've developed so far was based on the potential evapotranspiration and canopy basal area coverage. And it was developed to schedule daily fertigation for more optimal uh, feeding of water and nutrients to the trees of any size in the whole production season, the entire year. Um, less frequent fertilizer injections, for example, weekly, can be calculated by grouping consecutive daily amounts. And that function is in the model. I didn't show you that. That was in the yellow box. <clears throat> so if you, if you decide you don't need to do it every day, if there is flexibility, you may want to inject fertilizer only once every three days or every seven days or anything you like um, within reason. And it can group that for you automatically off the curve. It can, it can interpolate off the curve and give you that grouped amount. So it'll be a larger amount for seven days versus one day, obviously. Uh, for, for water, I would not recommend that, however, because this model is not a soil storage-based model. All right? uh, if you want to do less frequent irrigation, I recommend you use, like, for example, the water scheduling, irrigation scheduling model uh, that Kelly Morgan's developed, which is on the website, which does take into account the ability of water, of water storage in the soil. This does not have that mechanism in it. So this is for daily fertigation. 
at least the water part of it is, so that it's, it's assuming no storage is necessary. It's only feeding the tree on a daily basis. Um, so another feature of, uh, for future I want to put, add is a daily, or weekly, or monthly as applied tracking database to verify fertigation status and simplify course corrections. So in other words, on that smooth curve, it'll superimpose your actual as applied fertilizer so you can keep track of it. Am I above the line, below the line, or where am I? What do I need to do? So it's a very useful diagnostic tool. Uh, it was this was developed with open source programming software, so it's free software. Um, it's also possible for me to compile it for Apple Mac uh, computers. Um, in this first version, the irrigation schedules must be manually transferred to an irrigation controller. I pointed that out already. I was showing you a Netafim there, for example. Um, I also pointed out that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to put the DRIS diagnosis system in there. Um, and also, uh, finally, <clears throat> without making promises about when this will happen, but uh, there is a new fertigation controller that I'm developing, and this will integrate this DSP into the, the heart of the, that controller. It'll function with the actual controller, so you don't need to transfer the information from the DSP to a controller. It'll be integrated. So the controller will make and execute daily fertigation schedules automatically, including those course corrections and keeping track of records. And so, so here's an example, I just wanted to illustrate it. Um, this is what it might look like. This is actually a, a so this is a colored touchscreen embedded computer with rugged enclosure. And by illustration, this is one we developed, uh, which is now being sold by chemical containers, the CCI 8000 tree sense. Um, and it's been quite successful for variable rate agrochemical applications. So it's very nice, uh, small computer, very rugged, takes very little power. That's how I see uh, a good uh, integrated DSP new microcontroller based uh, irrigation controller working. And with that, um, I have a whole lot of acknowledgements I'd like to just show you on the screen, uh, which I'm very grateful for, for uh, funding sources and cooperation and uh, my technicians, Kevin Osler and Laura Walder on the top. And um, any further questions or information, if you'd like to try this out, uh, don't hesitate to email me. Here's my email address.